Um, uh, so good afternoon everyone. On behalf of the Friday lecture team I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Today is the opening event of the Friday lecture series for 2014. The theme for the next, weeks, the next eight weeks will be life after studio. Life after studio has many different meanings for people but what we want to explore is the reality of leaving the architecture studio and moving into the profession, the architectural profession. So over the next eight, eight weeks, we will have a range of speakers giving lectures at the school, each covering how they dealt with that transition. They've also been asked to reflect on three main factors that we believe have influenced their careers as architects. Um, these are their educational experiences, the economic climate that they work in, and the professional networks that they've built for themselves. We hope this lesson is being currently rethought in this country, primarily in terms of its relationship to practice and what is perceived as a disconnect between academic provision and professional needs. It is also being rethought in terms of its duration and the possible combination of years of study that are required to achieve qualification. Whilst these are undoubtedly relevant concerns, we fear vital aspects of this debate on education might be lost if it remains focused solely on these issues. So is education the opportunity for us to equip ourselves with the skills we need to be more entrepreneurial, to be adaptable to the challenge of this current economic climate and a changing profession? Maybe we're looking at an architectural education that equips us to deal with architecture for the 99% rather than the 1%. So, and also in this current climate where 44% of unqualified graduates, which is us when we finish our fifth year, and 22% of qualified architects are unemployed, we think it's clear that us as graduates need to become more flexible in order to respond and survive. So um, that's our opening. I'd like to thank ADS who are sponsoring the recording of this event. Their footage will be posted on the website for further and continued discussion. Um, they see this as part of a, a bigger debate they're having at the moment on an exhibition called Reactivate that's still on at the Lighthouse for the next two weeks. Um, just to note on this microphone, um, it doesn't amplify your voice, it just records, so speak up and speak into it. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Robert Mantho, who has kindly agreed to chair the debate today. Uh, Robert is the Stage 5 leader here at the Macintosh School of Architecture and the founder of Locus, the Collaborative Practice. Um, I just have been asked to um, make sure I explain the structure of the debate. What we've got is three questions, and so we'll be dealing with them in three sessions. Not every member of the panel will answer every question. I will read the question and ask the uh, corresponding member of the panel to answer the question. Each member of the panel will have five minutes to discuss their response or to respond to the question, and then we'll open up the question to the floor for 15 minutes. Um, again, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that the microphone doesn't amplify your voice, so you need to speak up and make, make sure you speak into it carefully. Um, I'd like to introduce the members of the, the panel. I'll start with Stuart Falconer, who is a young architect who graduated from Strathclyde in 2006. He received the RIAS Silver Medal Commendation as a student. He founded, or he is a founder of Grass Studio with Gunnar Groves Reigns, who's sitting right over here, in Edinburgh, formed in 2006 as part of the established conservation practice Groves Reigns Architects Limited. Lucy Mori is an independent consultant for architects focusing on, focusing on marketing, PR, and business development. Lucy specializes in helping architects to become more business-like. She is a contributor to the RIBA CPD training in marketing and business planning and lectures at the London Metropolitan University, London South Bank University, the Bartlett School of Architecture at the University of Central London, and the University of Cambridge. Professor Chris Platt is the head of the McIntosh School of Architecture and founding director of award-winning architectural practice Studio CAP. Chris is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy and was made a fellow of the Royal Incorporation of Architects Scotland in 2009. He lectures widely and is an alumni of the MAC. Hanukkah Scott Van Well is the director of Stone Opera, focusing on improving relationships between people and their built environment through interactive and playful architectural workshops. She's an architect registered both in the Netherlands and in the UK and is currently an architectural design tutor at Strathclyde University. David Gloster has been 
the Director of Education at the Royal Institute of British Architects since 2006. Prior to his current position, he was a principal lecturer and postgraduate course leader at the Department of Architecture and Design at London South Bank University. David is responsible for a variety of programs that support architectural schools, students, and academics. He oversees the RIBA program of validation as well. Ian Scott is founder of award-winning business, Cognitive Business Therapy, who are specialists in how people and organizations learn to be enterprising. He's an entrepreneur who helps people start their own businesses. Ian will provide a voice from outside of the discipline of architecture with an acute understanding of the challenges in today's commercial environment. So with those introductions, I'd like to ask the first question, which is, what is the purpose of architectural education today? What are we trying to achieve through that education? And the first person I'd like to answer that question is David Gloucester. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I think the purpose of a, 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 a long exposure to architecture education is actually that graduates come out of schools as versatile problem solvers um, who are able to survive in a variety of contexts, both in terms of the scale of enterprise that they work within, uh, the geographical location they work within, and uh, the nature of the problems which they're given uh, to solve. And essentially, if you take design as being an holistic intellectual pursuit, which can involve uh, seeing the design of a schedule for the delivery of a building uh, to the uh, design of a piece of ironmongery, it to reinvent itself very, very quickly. Um, this is probably a good thing because capitalism, which we are essentially a servant of, is also an amazingly versatile and quick-witted beast. Uh, and the, the marketization, I think, of uh, practice and the increasingly corporate uh, nature of globalized practice is something which we may all have a view on, but which we actually have to learn to live with and actually also need to learn to thrive within. So the purpose of a, an education in architecture, I think certainly uh, understanding what design in all its fullest uh, ramifications means is critical to that. Uh, at the moment we have, of course, um, uh, a structure which essentially has its provenance not even in the 1958 Oxford Conference on Architecture but actually in the 1929 con Congress uh, on Architecture Education. So the roots of the current system go back a very long way and uh, the purpose of architecture education should be fitness for purpose actually and it's a question of defining what that purpose is. Every school, I think, has a, a very good crack at doing it in their own particular way, but we don't have robust structures necessarily that allow us to compare and cr contrast those very, very different strategies towards architecture education. Um, I'd next like to ask Chris Platt. Okay, I want to read something just to sort of clarify a few of my own thoughts. I think contemporary practice is shifting further and further away from critical theory and academic preoccupations. And I think with the link between the academy and the profession is closer, the quality and the intelligence of the built environment and the discourse is generally higher, noticeably higher. I think the current student generation is more globally aware, more digitally switched on than any before it, and I think is interested in architecture as a social, cultural activity which makes people's lives better in a very fundamental way, be it here in the global north or somewhere else in the global south. I think profound need can sometimes be the catalyst for innovative thinking and a redefinition of professional roles. I think the way that architecture students learn in the studio is a school's unique selling point. And the lessons from the teaching ethos that comes from the studio is something that other university departments from other disciplines have long learnt as innovative teaching. And in the MAC, we highly value this idea of the studio of both a way of working and a physical place. And for the digitally switched on generation with the world's libraries only a click away, there's always a question, why do you go to a physical place? And the studio, in my view, is the answer to that. So I believe that architecture education should be unapologetically vocational in its ethos, not for training purposes, and concerned with lifelong learning and the practice of the next generation of architects. Those who envisage an architectural destination and can articulate built form to bear the imprint of human life and feeling, deserve the title architect, and those who have it or wish it are urgently required. 
So an architect's job, I think, is to create real quality where people come face to face with their built environment. And I think the purpose of architectural education is to inspire people to do that. Making, I think, is a privilege, and particularly in this mysterious digital age where we don't understand the tools we use, and we throw them away and upgrade, upgrade them as, as easy as we buy them. And so mastering them is never something that we do. So I want our agenda to redefine what the person of the architect is and what the relevance of architectural design is for the 21st century. And I think that agenda must address energy and technological innovation. And I think a school of architecture should be a place for innovative practice in its widest sense. And I think its location should be chosen to try and collaborate with as many studio-based disciplines as possible. The destination should be the gateway to an innovative and creative profession. So I want us to develop further a unique, as David says, holistic way of working, which is crucial to identify and resolve and address these growing environmental issues. Finally, I want the school, e-school, to be actively seeking to influence four key areas. The construction industry, which is research and skills bereft almost. The architectural profession, which often speaks to itself and not to others. The makers and procurers, who are often the employers of contemporary architects. And the general public, to break down barriers of elitism and taste. Thank you. And next, I would like to ask Lucy Mori. And the question, what is the purpose of architecture education, is really a response, I feel, to the fact that schools of architecture are failing to prepare students to practice as architects. This is not to say that schools of architecture are failing all students, because not all architecture students want to become architects. However, there is a problem when architectural practices cannot recruit competent staff. And there is a problem when newly qualified architects do not have all the skills to deliver a construction project or run their own practice. I have always believed that architecture is an excellent general undergraduate degree in the same way as law, you can study law and not become a lawyer, or eco economics or engineering. Many people in business and doing other activities have those, uh, those undergraduate degrees. And a degree in architecture teaches a range of creative, technical and communication skills which are transferable and valuable to many careers. Therefore, I believe there is a case for separating the vocational and professional qualifications from the courses taught in higher education establishments. So in terms of the question, I think there are two purposes of architectural education today. One is a general education and the second professional. So um, I'd like to open the question to the floor. Are there questions from, from anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to the Paris question to the panel? I'm interested in the relationship between the governing body of architectural education in the EU and in the UK, the RIBA, and how those decisions are made and how possibly one might trump the other and how there might not be an equal marriage between the two. Would anybody like to comment on that? Uh, it's, it's almost inevitable that it actually will produce uneven results because the, the, when the revised qualifications directive was passed by the European Parliament last October, uh, they've actually um, adopted two possible frameworks for the delivery of a minimum framework in architectural education. One is four years full-time study with two years of practical training, and the other is the five plus zero, where the zero might be more than zero, but it's five years full-time study with no practical training. Um, just to put this in context, and without wishing to say five and four too many times, the current um, minimum standard across the EU is actually for four years full-time study only. In point of fact, there are very few countries who really do this, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Greece uh, nominally all um, adopt this minimal framework. But you can see it differs significantly from what we're used to in the UK, where we've long recognized the, the proper synergies that should result from professional practice and architectural education. Um, I think the time now actually is to make sure that we in the UK um, adopt a robust model. In terms of how that's generated, um, the RIBA is in an odd place. We're simply a charter body. You know, a, a, a monarch of this country decided at one time that, that there would be a thing called the Royal Institute of British Architects, William IV, if I recall. 
Um, and we've been around, I think, now for 180 years. So there's quite a lot of momentum behind being around for so long. Uh, often when I walk around the building, I suspect it may be with the same personnel as it was in 1834. And I think there's a, a general perception that uh, we're slow to move. But ultimately, we're not the authority about this. We're simply somebody who has an established relationship with schools of architecture, both in the UK and worldwide. It is the statutory body, the Architects Registration Board, who ultimately have to um, sanction a model for architecture education. So all I can say is that we're pushing what we believe is going to be um, a flexible and better value model, but ultimately we have to take the statutory body with us. Uh, so, and various insignificant bodies like the Department of Communities and Local Government, you know, the government body, who are ultimately responsible for architectural education. So the number of stakeholders, I hate the word, but I'll use it anyway, you know what I mean by that, the number of interested parties that we have to take with us include the schools, include the statutory body, include government departments, include all the future students of architecture. So the problem is a very complex problem and one that we have to solve quite quickly. Any more questions? Qualifications and general education? I thought that was a rather profound statement. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it was mentioned that the, the purpose of an architectural education is to prepare for practice as an architect. Um, in order to practice as an architect, you need to first practice as an architect's assistant. And I think the, the skills required are maybe slightly different. And I wonder if, if uh, anybody on the panel feels that architecture schools adequately prepare people for practice as an architect's assistant in terms of the, the basic skills required to act in that role. You haven't spoken yet. Into the microphone, please. Don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> entrepreneurs are outsiders. And I've just been listening to what was being saying and reflecting. And actually, at the end of the day, the issue of separation is really pointless if you don't have any work and you don't have any money coming in. And one of the things I was reflecting on on this first question is you can't actually answer that because architectural education is irrelevant unless you set it in the context of society and what's happening today. So a little quick point. I did history, which had all the attributes that you've just outlined from doing architecture, except in my day, there were no fees and I got a grant and it was fantastic. And it was a great, it was a great subject to study. But we spent a lot of time justifying what you got out of history and where you were going to be. And I sat my first final in 1979, the day Margaret Thatcher came to power. We went into the building and she won the election and everybody kind of went, uh -huh. the wind has changed direction. A year later, it was virtually impossible for people to get jobs and teaching. The whole thing was in disarray. And we are now back at that situation just now. We are in a completely different world. And the real question is, why do you want to be an architect and what do you want to do after it? And you've got a choice. You can join the club and go and do the corporate work and take the shilling or you can do something different. But if you want to do something different, you have to recognise that you're going to have to be entrepreneurial about that and you're going to have to think differently and do different things. And there's also one final point. My course was paid for and I got a grant. It's a bloody expensive course now to have the luxury to say at the end, oh, well, you can maybe have transferable skills. That's not really on, and it's also a highly competitive market. So what I'm really going to say is, are you going to change the world? Because entrepreneurs do want to change the world, and if so, you're going to have to start thinking about it and how you do that and how you deal with people and how you bring architecture back into society. Thank you. Uh, actually, based on what you just said about history and what you've said about transferable skills and all of this, I'm curious as to your views on the role of history and theory in the future of architectural education. Is there a role for it and what should that be? I can maybe add something to that. Um, I'm in a really lucky position when I work in, a, in an office which I'm surrounded um, with architects who are specialists in conservation, restoration and, and such like. So for me, it's 
vital um, to understand how things used to be built and understand the, the fundamentals about that um, in order to design something of quality today that's that's going to last. I mean, I think the average life expectancy of a house is something like 50 years, 25, 50 years or something like that. And for me, that's just incredible because we should be designing things that are going to last 200 years rather than 20 years. Um, I've learned so much from being in that environment, which I don't think when I was at university I imagined I was going to be in because everybody thinks, oh, well, I like contemporary design, so that's all I'm going to do. But understanding that those fundamentals and the fact that you see building, I live in a building, I've always lived in a house that, that's been hundreds of years old just because I'm more comfortable there and I like that lifestyle and, and the way that building feels and, and the quality and, I, I, you know, I may have to repair it more often, but I know it's going to last me longer. So for me, it's that, that historical aspect is, is fundamental. Uh, I certainly think history should still be taught in architecture schools, but I think there are many other uh, subjects that should be taught. If you think about the role of the architect who's actually designing and delivering buildings in the current, uh, in the current society, the process of procuring and delivering buildings has changed enormously. And if you're thinking about the kind of clients, the professional clients, the developers, investors or contractors or local authorities who are commissioning buildings who are employing architects. In fact, they're not employing the architect first. They often engage a quantity surveyor, a project manager, a letting agent or a surveyor before the architect. And architects are often seen as expensive and out of touch with reality. And they're brought in because they need to have get through planning. There's a tricky planning site. They're going to need something a bit clever, something beautiful. And the architects may create a beautiful image, but it may be too expensive. And unfortunately, many architects do not understand the economics of property development and investment. So I'd like to see an architectural education encompassing cost analysis, project management, finance, business, engineering, the industrialization of producing elements, BIM, maintenance, energy efficiency. Uh, it's a huge subject uh, and, and probably too much and specialization will be necessary. And I would take the lead from uh, some other, maybe a more historical, traditional conservation design architect, or you may be a more project management uh, architect who has a good understanding of the financing of, of development projects and can do the cost analysis and can make good decisions up front for the client. Because if you look back over time, the architect traditionally had the leadership role on a construction project, and that has been lost. And I really think there is an opportunity in these changes to architectural education for the architect to reclaim that leadership. But the way in doing that is really having to understand what is needed in order to design and deliver a building in, in today and in the future. Thanks. Um, several people have kind of talked about this idea of it being vocational. Um, so say I went and did not architecture, I was a dentist or a doctor, I'd come out five years and that's what I would do. I would go and be, I, I would leave university being able to be a dentist or be a doctor. Do you see architecture as vocational in terms of it gets you the job, the job of an architect, or it gets you a job, kind of when you talk about it being vocational? I'll say something because I've not said anything yet. <laughs> I think that's a really important and valued question. Um, when, when we start education, whether that's architecture or becoming a dentist, I don't think we're fully sure what we've committed ourselves to. Um, so I think any educational process should prepare ourselves for life after that, whether that is becoming a dentist or becoming an architect. Um, when it comes to architecture, though, and I'm not, I don't know much about the dentist profession, so maybe I'm wrong here, but when it comes to architecture, I think it's such a wide variety of skills that are required that go beyond that line on the drawing. Um, it goes, uh, you, you need to be able to communicate, you need to be able to, vo to be vocal about it, you need to have an opinion, you need to um, uh, be able to design, but I think the most important thing is to understand what you want to do is to provide a sustainable environment eventually. And that means you need to understand the brief, you need to understand the people that use it. So understanding social skills, understanding the human psychology, all that should also be part of architectural education. And I think 
I don't think we can go back to the traditional role of the architect where the architect is leading because we've, we've I don't know, there, there's so many other consultancies that all uh, represent the original role of the architect at the time. We don't, we, we cannot oversee all those uh, elements in a delivery process anymore, like construction engineering, like uh, a quantity surveyor. In the old days, it was the architect that did that. We cannot do all that anymore ourselves. Um, but we have to be aware of them. We have to be uh, confident in dealing with them in a delivery process and all that should be touched upon during education. And whether that makes you a good architect in the end or potentially a good developer maybe. Why not? Become a developer after studying architect. I think that that would be fantastic. Um, so I don't know whether that answers your question, but I do think the architectural profession is so widely defined. Um, we should be prepared for that as, as students, but we should also should feel confident when uh, we graduate. Can I, just, can I just, just jump in before you, Chris? I think the thing is that um, well, you get taught how to design and you can apply that process of design and making something to quite a lot of different things. So. The skills to design a building in, in some ways aren't that much different to designing a product. You're still going through the same reiterative process. So I don't think just because you do architecture, you have to then be an architect. And I think in some cases now, students have had to think, well, I've done this five to seven year architectural education and there isn't a job for me. So they've been forced to look elsewhere. Um, I, I'd just quite like to say, I'd quite like to get away from this idea implicit in some of these comments that the purpose of a school of architecture is somehow to train for the profession. It's not. Uh, I'm, the view, I'm of the view very much that town and gown should come closer together, but I'm not, in, I'm not in favour of the school training for what you're going to do in the profession because you can look back through history and see that, you know, the discipline of architecture, even though the profession is very young, the, the topic uh, creates a whole series of different models, the Parthenon, Hillhead Primary School, my house, you could all describe perhaps as architectural. So the discipline doesn't really change that much throughout history. What changes is all of the external influences on it. That's where schools of architecture have to be nimble, agile, aware. They're not necessarily there to cover all of the ground in this fastly changing profession because it changes all the time. In my experience, uh, a lot of the things that are being raised here are things that you can't really learn properly until you're in practice. It presumes that we just learn here and somehow when you're in practice, you're just doing it and you're not learning it. Well, it's very much the opposite. There's huge leaps. I remember very vividly and I left school, went straight into an architect's office for four years before coming in as a full-time student here. So I deliberately didn't want to be a student, still actually don't, uh, <laughs> deliberately wanted to be a somebody who was working, who was doing it, I saw it as something practical. And it was only later that I realised the real luxury and the pleasure of studying it. But it was something that I studied that I had, I had already started to do. So all of these new, and even in the last 10 years, the new roles, the new specialisms, the new players in the industry, the new responsibilities and leaderships and the changing role of the architect, these are all things that the architect has to address, but they don't necessarily change the values or the qualities, because at the end of the day, as I say, there are people who have to set what I would call an architectural destination, who lead by the vision. And I don't mean that in a romantic way, not because they're contractually the leader, but the meeting doesn't take, the meeting doesn't really get going until the architect's there, regardless of whether the project manager or the client or the contractor is actually the employer. That's what we're trying to help you guys take with you this versatility, this range of skills to be adaptable in this changing circumstance. If you don't have an idea of why you're doing it, there's no point in coming up with all these skills and changing roles and whatever you want to call it. You need to know why you're doing it. The other thing I want to just say before I pass on to Chris, I think I want to say something, is that it's very difficult to know what you want to do when you are choosing your subjects at school, regardless of whether you're an architect or a doctor or whatever. So you quite often find something more or a clarity about these things only when you've already made that commitment. And in my case, well after I became an, uh, became an architect in practice. So I wouldn't be in a rush or in, you're particularly anxious to think you've got to gather all this stuff in your haversack before you go into practice. You don't. You need to be ready to learn. 
And for me, that meant a five-year, very consciously, a five-year learning process after my part three. Uh, and that was me already with four years under the belt. So it's an attitude more than a particular set of skills. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm hogging. No, no, no. Hanukkah just, I thought, made a really exciting suggestion. Be a developer. Um, entrepreneurs cannot do anything until they visualise. They've got to, and it takes a while to visualise, and they love a bit of chaos and a bit of anarchy, because that's the fun and changing the rules and going, oh, why is that done that way? We could do this. And it is actually quite interesting, because when you actually say become a developer, it means that you can use your architectural skills and learning and apply it in practice in ways that actually fit what you would like to see happening. But you learn to be an entrepreneur by doing. It's not something that's taught, it's not born, it's not made, it's by doing. And the three key things are, first of all, you learn how to negotiate your resources. And that really is quite an interesting one, because your ability to interact with clients and people and confer and discuss and take people with you is vital. The next thing is you learn by doing, which I've said. And the third thing is you do that by a can-do attitude. And it's people going, well, that's rubbish, and learning how to overcome that. But in Woodlands, in the corner, in a dare like, I think it was a former bomb site, there's a new development that's going up. It's um, the decaying area, fascinating, walk past it. Um, it's a corner site and they're putting in artist studios. It's not bricks, it's not cement, it's wooden sheds. And I walked past that and it's next to the community garden. And there is this set of really interesting wooden sheds for artist studios. And it gave me such a kick to see that. And I think it must have given the architectural practice that has designed that such a kick to do that. But it's highly entrepreneurial. It's low cost, it's cheap, you can see it and it can emerge. It's not big, it's not grand, but it's a start. And that's how you learn by doing. And that's the kind of thing that really has to start coming across, having a shot at something and learning how it goes. I'm going to have to preclude the discussion and go on to the next question. So the second question is, how can architecture students be educated in a more flexible and economic means for them, for, for the actual students? And the first person I'd like to answer that question is Mr. Scott. Well, actually, I'm really interested in comments. I mean, I don't know if architects can ever be entrepreneurs. Name, a, name an entrepreneur that was an architect. Any takers from the... Andy Barlow. Andy Barlow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, we, and we don't Frank, see Frank them on the, on the Apprentice, sorry. Frank Gehry was, was quite entrepreneurial it, when he started off. I would put him down as a highly successful businessman. <laughs> who makes a lot of money. I'm not quite sure that that's the same as entrepreneurship. Yeah, I'm curious in the way he's developed his practice. Um, he's done it in a non-conventional way. I Which think. brings us to what do you want out of this whole thing? And actually, one of the things people talked about was a job. Actually, are there jobs out there? And if you want that job, you're going to have to do something. An ex-architect friend of mine who now makes jewellery said, Oh, I left. She said, um, it's either run by psychopaths and you're a cad monkey in front of them, or this, this. I thought, well, that's pushing it, Anne. But she was actually making a point. That's why she wanted out of it. She didn't want to be part of that. She wanted to do something different. She's using all of our architectural skills now in making jewellery. And actually, it's not the making, it's the designing, and she'll take it on to the next level. I think what's coming out here is that has to be through something which is a bit nimble, flexible, learning by doing and having a shot at things. And actually, can you offer your services as a student free of charge to people who want to do something? You can offer them for money as well. <laughs> you can offer them for the money as well. And that's you already moving into. I mean, actually, that is an interesting point. If on that basis you say we'll help you do all of this. Legally, what, what does that actually mean? Are there implications from... You can, you, can, you, can, uh, you don't need to call yourself an architect to practice architecture. That's, it's just a title that's protected. Whether you get commissions in architecture is another question. But you don't need to, uh, you don't need to be qualified. You don't need to come through an architectural uh, school. And from the point of view of students working, I don't, I'm not quite sure if your question is about working with an architect or just working generally? Working generally. Oh, that's, there's no limits to what students can do, as far as I'm concerned. 
Well, that was a tag team answer to the question. <laughs> so I think cleverly avoided. No, no, I, I'll answer the question. Oh, oh well, you, you yeah, sorry, well. you'll have to wait till the comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to ask uh, Stuart Falconer to answer the question. Uh, the question is, <laughs> how can architecture students, sorry, how can architecture students be educated in a more flexible manner and a more economic manner for, for students? How can they be educated in a more economic manner? Flexible well, I think one of the examples is across the road. Now, actually, that's the first time I've seen that building. And actually, one of the important things for me is that multi sort of disciplinary side to it, because I think maybe sometimes, certainly in my education, we were in an architecture building and you did architecture and you didn't really want to talk to anyone else. And I think there's a real merit in speaking to other people, working with other people, understanding what skills they have, how you might apply them, how you can work together. Collaborating, I think, is one of the most important things. And, and the building across the road, for me, just the first time I've seen it today, certainly internally, you're walking around and you can see somebody doing something you might otherwise never have seen. So for me, that is a really, really important aspect of, of being able to be more flexible because it opens your eyes up to seeing to other things. Um, if you work for yourself all the time, I think you're just limited in what your own capabilities are. As soon as there's somebody else in the room with a different attitude, it opens up multiple possibilities. I, I guess, I, I mean, I'm sort of stepping outside my role as the chairman here just to try to clarify the question. I think what, what the students are wondering is, are there other modes of education such as, you know, part-time, we at the school have a part-time mode and I think we're one of the only schools mm. in Scotland. I think there's a couple of schools in the rest of the UK. But are there other ways that the, the model of education be, could be more flexible and not quite so expensive for students? I think that, I think that was the gist of the question. I'll ask the organizers to confirm that. <laughs> um, look, I mean, the. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have a, a, a little five minute aside. It's not in the agenda, but we'll let, we'll let um, uh, David Gloucester answer that question because he's involved intimately in that process. Uh, the, the, the fact is that the UK, of course, does architecture education exceptionally well. I can say that from first-hand observation of architecture education delivered globally, whether it's Latin America, the Middle East, the Far East, uh, Russian Federation, we do do it very, very well. And th the first thing we need to reassure ourselves is that we actually have a pretty good model here. The big problem is that that model is subject to political pressures, which we couldn't have anticipated. And Ian's points about being paid to be a student, as indeed I was, not very much. And I spent most of my grants on an electric guitar, which I've never regretted either. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the important thing is the circumstances under which you're studying, the circumstances under which we studied are hugely different. And the circumstance in which you practice your craft. But, the question about responsiveness and more economic models, of course there can be. I mean, it, it's, it's absurd really to suggest that you shouldn't be able to draw down an electronic learning module at 3 a.m. in the morning after you've just got back off a hard day's, half, half day's work in the practice that's sustaining you or the bar that you're working as a bartender in. Of course, you should be able to study and have access to information and access to your learning 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I think the construct of sitting in a room like this is absolutely great. And you know, the reason one comes to events like this is to, to get this kind of intimacy of exchange between people. But the reality is that we all gather information, not knowledge. We may need to distinguish between information and knowledge. We've actually got too much information, not enough knowledge. And the classroom probably provides the filter between these things. I think we would certainly like to see entirely different models for learning. The RIBA office-based exam, for example, is a distance learning scheme where, in some cases, the online tutors never ever meet the candidates who they're tutoring. Um, it's been running for 10 years now. It has something like 250 candidates registered on it. And that's just one example. Um, Part-time study is obviously another one. But I think the idea of a peripatetic student of architecture who's not necessarily registered at any one university, but simply acts like a kind of 
gorilla um, taking gorilla, not the gorilla, um, act, uh, taking taking academic modules from a, a network of schools, which might be global, not even national, is the kind of model that we have to look at in the future. We can't kid ourselves that we have a monopoly on knowledge in the UK, or that we have a monopoly on the means to deliver it through what has actually become, I would argue, a pretty inflexible system for architectural education. Yes, it can be done more cheaply. I think there's uh, a way of being able to uh, identify very, very um, self-critically the fact that there is quite a lot in the architecture curriculum which is sacrificial. We need to be very, very careful now with students paying £9,000 a year that you aren't exposed to something that is incredibly entertaining but essentially sacrificial. The course needs to be stripped down to its basics and I certainly don't discount the issues that Lucy is talking about about business skills indeed I think that it's fundamental that the part three elements the professional skills elements need to make everybody understand that whether we like it or not we're working to and responding to a commercial context but we we need to be super analytical and the lead has to come from the schools the RIBA can only provide a kind of sketch in the air of what these models will become, but ultimately the schools have to be prepared to stage their own coup d'etats internally to actually provide models which are fit for the 22nd, let alone the 21st century. I just would like to ask Hanukkah to answer or respond to the question. Um, first of all, education costs money. Um, Tutors cost money, a building costs money, um, there's, there's many aspects. Education costs money and you just have to accept that. I'm still paying for my education and I graduated 16 years ago. Um, and I think it's important that you, that, I know that sounds horrible, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's been worth every penny. I had a fantastic time as a student and it has really equipped me to uh, a really happy life I'm leading just now. It's been worth every penny and this is how you should see it. You should invest in yourself and it costs money. Um, to my surprise, as a Dutch person coming to Scotland, I found that a lot of students actually don't work next to their study. Um, I, I've been uh, teaching at um, uh, and tutoring here for a couple of years now and it, it seems more an exception than the rule that students work and I know architectural course takes a lot of your time but I found time to work next to it um, and it, you just have to make the balance yourself so that was my first thing I wanted to say it costs money um, then of course there are ways to make it easier and um, um, there's the, the, lear the learning environment is all around you I mean architecture is, is when you walk in the street when you go on holiday you, you see architecture all the time um, so you can soak up knowledge without any tutor without any architectural department uh, and you can t um, teach yourself basically a lot about the build environment showing interest and any uh, um, educational organization it's up to you as a student what you get out of it so uh, again it's about that investment in yourself make the most out of it while having fun really important that last bit as well. Um, what I also want to say is that there's a model in uh, the Netherlands and I think that is quite unique. I'm not sure how uh, that is used in other countries. In, in the Netherlands you can study either at the university and I think they also offer part-time courses but you can also study at the academy and the academy, architectural academies, there's five or six of them in the whole country offer a course after you've um, graduated as a technical engineer. This is a, a part-time course, uh, either in evening hours, depending on which city you, you choose, or um, in the weekend hours. And basically, so you're about 24 at this point, you've, you've graduated as a technical engineer, and you find yourself a job three days a week, an architectural practice as an assistant, to come back to your question, Gunnar. Um, and, um, the other time in the week you used to study architecture. Now this, has, this model has become so popular and so successful, it uh, actually makes a really good bridge with practices. Practices are really keen to get a student from one of the academies instead of the universities, because they, by that time, they, the total course is five years. By that time, they've got five years in practice and they've studied architecture. Because they have decided to study onwards, 
there's a drive these students want to learn want to work want to create beautiful things so the attitude is there the, the knowledge is there um, and these students are really committed so there's actually there, there's a real take from practices another thing i have to say is that practices tutor at these academies so they do this in the evening hours and weekend hours um, so they actually get a first look at what will be out there once these students graduate. So they get picked up straight away. There's like a 90% guarantee of a job. Um, because these students are working, there's money coming in that can pay for the course. So it balances out quite well. What it does mean is that it's a huge commitment. And at the time I chose not to do it because for me, I still wanted to enjoy life, go to films and travel and do all those kind of things. I couldn't commit to such a model, but it's definitely economically interesting to look at. So we're going to open that, the, uh, the question to the crowd and see if anybody would like to. Ah, at the back, Mr. May. Uh, I've been enjoying the conversation greatly and I'm particularly taking what uh, by what David Gloucester is saying about the RIBA's view on these matters. Because I think very often schools of architecture hide behind the validation things. They say, no, 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 we, we can't do anything experimental or innovative because uh, we're on the line when it comes to the validation visits. My own experience has been that the RIBA, when one went to them with uh, innovative ways of doing things in the education, we were pushing a, an open door. So I'm glad to hear that that would likely to still be the case. And I'd like to couple that with what uh, Lucy Mori said. It, it, of course, we can't deal with everything. And if we try to, then I think we just make a mess of things. But the idea of a core, a stripped down core, which all students uh, uh, follow, um, topped up by electives and specialisations in later years. And I think that's the way to cover the area and to uh, keep abreast of innovative technologies that are coming on the scene, particularly IT and so on. Um, I think they should also be encouraged to have uh, differentiation between schools of architecture. There's no reason why we shouldn't all be do trying to do the same thing. And I think uh, something that, that perpetuates uh, the traditional way of dealing with things is the recycling of recent graduates onto the staff. It seems to me that that's just not a very good idea. Are there any other questions that you'd like to put? Uh, it strikes me that this idea that architecture, architectural education has to move down a line towards being economic and commercially minded is, is a great way of killing university education dead. Um, university education isn't technical college. If we want a technical college, we could go to a technical college. U university education, based on a model from the ancient Greeks, is about pleasure. It's about the slow accumulation of knowledge and understanding, as Chris described it to find made earlier. A dentist learns how to be a dentist. It's an objective set of rules and knowledge based around that dentistry or being a doctor or a lawyer is based around. It grows and evolves over, over time, but when you open up someone's mouth, there's a definite thing in front of you that you have to definitely deal with. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's like, I don't know, something like 80 teeth or something and a tongue. And, and, and you... I have no idea. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I've uh, but, but, the point, but the point is, with architecture, there is none of that. You're given a site and there are no rules. There is nothing specific or objective about what we're de doing. Certainly these days, whether that's a good thing or, or bad is, is besides the point. The thing is, we can't tell students the answer and give them BIM and give them CAD lesson and all of that. They're going to do that for the rest of their lives. And I think it's a disastrous idea. It would literally denude universities of any of their beauty and poetry, and it would be three years of depression. <laughs> I, go, I go back to my first point. My first point, I did suggest that there was a division between the general degree 
and the profession, and they weren't necessarily the same. I agree that uh, there is a lot of benefit and, and joy should be in architectural uh, education as an undergraduate degree. But if you're talking about training people to become architects, I think that is different. And I think that um, the current system is very rigid. Uh, and if we just, the, the more general point here is about flexibility. Um, I think there shouldn't be one set way to become an architect. There should be lots of different routes to get there, but there perhaps could be an independent professional examination that could be taken that whether you, whatever route you came through, whether it was through working more professional practice or, or working on a site um, or doing uh, uh, writing theoretical research, they were all valid routes to take you towards uh, becoming an architect. Um, there's, a, there's a piece I read recently by Peter Buchanan who talked about having a shared foundation year um, as part of an undergraduate degree where you had the urban planning, uh, landscape designers and architects working together for that first year. And I thought that was a very uh, interesting way of getting a shared, a broader collaborative understanding uh, as, at the beginning of your career when, as you say, you're not quite sure which way um, you're wanting to go. And there are other uh, more flexible approaches being looked at at the moment. Will Hunter has got a project for a new London School of Architecture with an idea of a new diploma that will be half the cost of the current diplomas because there will be no no school, there will be no, ver no real buildings um, and there will be much closer relationship between the students and practice. They'll be working or working in the practice much more in the model and I'm sure you must have been inspired by the, by the Dutch model. So there are, I'm hopeful that there are more flexible ways coming through. It was, I'm picking up on a point you made, David. Uh, it was about the connection between between the architectural education and what essentially gets built. Uh, you mentioned that the education in the UK is, I guess, one of the best architectural educations you can get. But for me personally, there's a bit of a disconnect between that education and what essentially gets built. And in the UK, at least, most of, it, most of it's crap. <laughs> and what people have to live in and what people have to put up with in terms of average room sizes and average amounts of daylight is quite low and quite low in comparison to other countries. So in terms of the education that we get and what gets built, is there something that can change there which actually influences crap not being built anymore? If you, if you know what I mean, not crap, but like sort of bad buildings or small rooms or small, day, you know, these types of things. I, first, firstly, to take the question about denuding architecture courses of all the, the juice, I mean, there's absolutely no intention to do that. In fact, if I was offering a critique on the national provision in the UK, whilst, whilst I'm not going to um, withdraw any of the comments made earlier about its, its basic excellence, I think there is a fundamental lack of risk uh, being taken by a majority of schools, dare I say it. Which, which is actually in relation to speculating about what architecture can be. And I do think this is problematic. Um, there is the, <coughs> the bifurcation between the analog and digital worlds is partly responsible for it, but I think there's also a kind of intellectual stasis, which uh, actually does relate to the, the broader question of where the UK sits in the world offer of architecture education. And the reality is there are plenty of places I can tell you where they're getting very, very hot and very, very good at it and actually can nick the market share that the UK has had a monopolistic hold on for a very, very long time. So we need to be extremely vigilant, certainly from the point of view of what the RIBA is willing to endorse to pick up the speaker at the back. We're actually extremely open about it. And any school that says, well, we'd love to do that, but the RIBA won't let us, is just fundamentally misunderstanding what the purpose of architecture education is. They're actually sewing themselves into the straitjacket and actually shortchanging all the viewers' students from the potential that you can all have as problem solvers. Yes, of course, a lot of the built environments, take up your point, is miserable. And I think it does relate to getting back some of our market share, as it were, by simply being better architects. And the reality is actually quite a lot of architects aren't terribly good designers, sad to report. Um, and this, this should not be the case. Generally speaking, I think the 
pick up a previous comment about the value of history and theory. The value of history and theory is actually about being able to situate the quality of ideas that you have and act as an advocate for them in the same way that in a courtroom you have to advocate a defense of a client or the prosecution of a, of a person. We actually need to be better advocates for what we do. And I think the lessons that we can learn from history and theory does do this. Now, all this actually comes just down to a conclusion that this is a course which is among the most demanding in the world in terms of the information that you have to have at your disposal, the ability you have to have to play yourself into different roles, to be able to work with, a, a let's say, an oligarch who has two billion pounds at their disposal for development. Uh, uh, and at the same time, a hod carrier on the side. We do need to be extraordinarily nimble, very flexible, very responsive. And this is a huge demand that we're placing on ourselves. But unless you got it fundamentally wrong when you walked in through the School of Architecture's front door on the first day of the first week of the first term of the first year, I would suggest that you're all well up to it. But you do need to challenge yourselves. And the profession actually won't beat a path to your door unless you beat a path to its door and I think developing the synergy between the profession and the schools in a creative way so that we bring that connection between education and training a point that Chris made very very well earlier it's a massive distinction we need to be clear what one offers the other and actually the profession shouldn't be lazy about this it has a responsibility to all of you Frankly, I would not wish a graduate from a medical school who graduated yesterday to open my chest and look at my heart. I would probably take somebody who had about 15 years of experience, still had a good pair of legs, a good eyesight and a steady hand, but with that experience as well as the education behind them, they're the person I'd want to open my chest, not the recent graduate. Now that applies equally to architecture, the learning through doing that we've heard a lot of about, and which is absolutely fundamentally correct. Let's face it, you get better at doing architecture through reiteration. That's why Wright was still doing it at the age of 93. Um, some of me want to support what you're saying, David, but there's also a part of me where, where we differ from the medical profession, um, where we've got either a mouth or a body in front of us. Um, Architecture requires vision when you've got a blank canvas and this is where young spirits come in uh, or can come in and change things and I completely agree with the statement about the crap that was made earlier. Um, I, I'm surprised because I, I agree with, with uh, uh, when you look in Britain, when you look around, the architecture still being provided just now is not high standard, especially the housing stock is of really poor quality architecturally wise. And um, how, why, why is this? And I want to ask you this question. I want to actually request, make this request to you. When you come out of this course, and I'm sure you all will become uh, uh, really good at what you're going to do after this course, but could you please make sure that your new employer is going to change um, and, and make better architecture? Because I think the biggest problem is, is that by stepping back, okay, you're, you're graduated and you go and work for an office and you, you be humble and you learn from the people in the office. You actually very slowly lose your vision, your enthusiasm, your ambition that you had when you were studying. So my request to you is hold on to that. And while learning and uh, practice, also maintain that feeling of wanting to do something new, something different and question your employer, is this good enough? I've got a better idea. Um, so the third question is, is the traditional architect still necessary? And this is open to any speaker on the panel. Chris would like to answer that question. You fool, you should have hung on to the mic before. <laughs> That's what entrepreneurs do. You <laughs> 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 cannot follow that. I'd like, to dis I'd like to sort of break away from this distinction between traditional and something else, to be honest, because uh, I think implicit in the question, uh, for me the answer is it's a question of scale. The profession at the moment is polarised between uh, what happens in large practices and what happens in smaller practices, and it's to do with scale. If you're being asked to design a large project, then there's a whole series of, of procurement methods, contracts, interdisciplinary 
activities that take place and you are brought into. If you're dealing with a small project, the chances are you're dealing exactly directly with the contractor, you know the client, they're paying you, and so on and so forth, and you've got a small team of uh, other consultants. It's to do with scale rather than tradition. I don't think there's anybody, particularly from my perspective, and I'm played a small practice, nobody is in any way sitting in some sort of romantic cloud thinking, yes, I'm not going into CAD, I'm holding on to that 0.25 or whatever it was. Uh, I don't think that exists. I think some of the most innovative, uh, thoughtful and challenging work comes out of tiny practices. And I think that's as much to do with the method of, of generating projects as actually delivering them. So I think, for me, there are some things that I would say are really important, have been really important for a long time, but they've got more to do with values and qualities and aspirations rather than particular roles. For instance, I mean, to answer the, the well, maybe I shouldn't answer the last question. I think to answer the last question, which might be something to do with this, I think there are two things that would make uh, perhaps your experience as a student uh, less expensive, and they're related to the modes of learning and the length of the course. And both those can be explored. And I'm particularly unconvinced that we've got the best model of the length of course and the relationship to practice. I think there's a far more interesting agile model where students are related in some way, linked into those practices that are actually teaching. That's difficult to get right because practices are at the mercy of the market as well. But nevertheless, there are models of doing that. And what you might do in an office might actually be credit worthy. That we haven't even explored in, in this school. Second one is the, the modes of learning. And that's something we are exploring. We have a part-time course. We've just commissioned and received a large study looking at the future of part-time courses. And that relates to modes of learning as well as just whether you're coming in one or two days a week as I did for four years. So I think those two things are really crucial because the two most expensive things in education are staff costs and the physical learning and teaching environment. And as I said at the very beginning, we think coming in to be around your peers, even more importantly than be around us, is very important. And so jetting from one school to another and picking up modules here and there might actually be fine on paper, but it doesn't get you to interact in the same way with your peers. And that's actually where the real learning occurs. <coughs> so it's a challenging thing, but nevertheless, those two for me are the two things that could be adjusted. I think we're actually getting to a really interesting point here. One, the minute you start talking about getting a job, the question is what kind of job that is going to be. If it is with a big practice, if that is where you want to go, you will have to pursue a particular approach and career path. In the same way that somebody that wants to run I, well, Shell or BP goes down a particular route. The corporate route, you burnish the CV, you play the game, you do what is asked, you become adept at competence-based recruitment exercises, you get to the top of the pole, and you're probably when you get there, because all of your life has been spent getting to the top of the pole. But if that is the route that you want to take, that is what it involves. If you don't want to play that game, you need to seriously think about what that means for you as an architect now. And it is an issue of not being a traditional. Or a, there is a totally different world out there. People are really loving buildings in a way that they haven't done for a while. And I was on the town centre review group and it was really interesting working with planners and architects and all sorts of people. But there's a key thing. It's people that make places fantastic. And the three elements that we want to see are people, place, and prosperity. And architecture is a means to an end. And there are community groups, and there are businesses out there, and there are individuals that want to make their lives better, and they want to work with somebody that can help them make their life or their business better. But if you're gonna do that, you need to have all the skills to understand. You need to be able to work with people. You need to make sure that the building you're coming up with realises their aspirations and not just yours. And it's again this learning thing. And that is a different approach. And there's a whole breed of architects out there. We heard about Indy Johan Zero Zero Architecture moving into the development side of things. There's so many more options for you out there. There are so many more people wanting. But the only way it will work 
is people skills and understanding. And if you've got a vision of what you want to do, you're going to have to sell that, but not in the commercial way. It's actually working with the client. Patronage is the old way that it was used where the client was a patron of the architect. That's changed. But these things have to be reflected in architectural education. Working with people and getting a job really helps do all of that. Working behind a bar, paying for things, really improves your skills. Probably makes you a better architect as well. I have to agree with uh, what you were saying. Some very good, very good points there. Um, but just going back to the original question, I think was about the traditional role of the architect, does it exist? And I think, ignoring the word traditional, that the, the architect is unique in having that vision of what the potential of a project is. And um, nobody else really in the process, unless you're working with a very enlightened client, um, has, that, has that vision and, and that, shouldn't be, that really shouldn't be forgotten and that is where the opportunities are. But I'd really reinforce all the other points um, that have just been made by Ian. I just, I just wanted to bring up the point before, and maybe related to what you guys are talking about now. You, what you were saying before about the, the, the students, and we have to go out and do things better. But as, as uh, David Chipperfield would always have it, that Britain is developer-led and not led by the architect. So kind of therein lies the problem that the developers are leading in, which is maybe why so much stuff is miserable in the first place, because they maybe has, some, has something to do with it. But the question of whether an architect is necessary, if most of the stuff that is being built isn't very complex and anybody can kind of design it, why do you need so many architects or why are architects needed if well, such I think that's where the opportunity is uh, if you go and work for a practice that doesn't is doing developer led work they might not have the 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 vision or the skills or the creativity to within the constraints of the develop the, the developers const financial constraints the site constraints that's where the real opportunity for a talented architect is to get some really good architecture out of that and that's one of the reasons when I came out of architecture school, I wanted to work in a big commercial practice where I could, I could really try and make, on a, on a large scale city centre, shopping centre, mixed development project, really have some input into getting some good, trying to get some good quality design through that process. And I think that the opportunity and the challenge for a, for a young architect is even greater and, and, and bigger and more wonderful and more exciting in that kind of environment. I completely second that. Um, one of my, my uh, eye-opening moments in my uh, early architecture career was um, in, in Holland as a young practice. I set up my own practice straight away after graduating because I think I'm too uh, hard-headed to work for another company, unfortunately. Uh, I set up my own practice and uh, we realized um, there's, there's a lot of housing commissions uh, for young architects in Holland and they're great they're absolutely fantastic and you'll see that because of that the actual standard of social housing in Holland is quite high because there's a strong ambition to do your utter best because this is your first commission as a young architect and um, the, the, the not so um, visionary other architectural practice actually need to keep up with the younger ones because they're doing really really well because of it um, but my eye-opening moment was with this very traditional social um, housing association that wanted the gutters and the, the drainage pipes accessible at all times for their technical team uh, if something was wrong. And they actually, with that uh, traditional um, um, approach, they actually made it really, really easy for us to find the creative opportunities because they were so... Um, direct in what they were looking for and actually opened up a whole lot of opportunities for us to actually play with the idea of where can I, where can the gutter go that I can still touch it but we we can still make it look beautiful and um, so those restraints um, are actually quite powerful developers in Holland are known for a bit more progressive approach uh, because they do allow young architects to build for them or to design for them. However, they've got other limitations that you wouldn't even uh, see here. For instance, uh, my first commission, a developer had already bought the bricks 
um, before they started appointing architects. And they, uh, once, there were five architects involved and we were given the bricks, there were five types of bricks and we could all pick one. Um, and um, we were given two shapes of windows. And that's it. And we had to design with that. Now, how limited can it be? However, that became a full palette for us to start playing with. So we started playing with patterns. We started to turn the brick around. We started to move the windows. Um, and suddenly we talked about dissonance. Like if you've got a strong pattern, can you put the window, one, one window slightly up? And we really became musicians and, and sort of creative people within that. And I really enjoyed that experience. And this was the most traditional housing association in Holland. Um, so do take up that challenge. I completely back up what uh, Lucy is saying. Just, uh, one of the things I wanted to go back to about um, developer being developer-led in this country, and I think that is true uh, to, to quite a, a strong degree. Um, one of the interesting uh, companies that we uh, got involved with a little bit um, down south was a company called Cathedral, and they are a a developer who go around actively looking for sites in London that nobody else will touch. One developer wants one person to deal with by the land and they do what they want. These guys look for <coughs> areas and really, uh, really, really done uh, rundown areas that are in, in dire need of something. They have 70 stakeholders, so nobody else will touch it. And they go to the council and say, well, what do you need? And they end up um, just doing something on that site. So they stuck a cafe in a, in a train carriage and that acted as a catalyst, back to what you were talking about, which grew and now that is a, a really up and coming site with a huge big multi-purpose multi, multi -purpose building on it. So that sort of model of actually just doing it, starting something, the local community are in there from the start. So it's not something which is built, then you shout for the community and nobody wants to go there. And that was a, an, a, a model which I was completely fascinated by and produces something far more successful than something which is cr dumped on a site and, and made as small as possible to make maximum profit. So for, for me, that was a, something which was really successful and, and should be looked at further. So. I think Hanukkah introduces an interesting issue which I think is very much part of uh, contemporary construction culture, which is the fact that now uh, I think as many architects work for contractors or with contractors as within their companies, as there used to be in local authorities about 25 years ago. And I think for me, one of the key things about being an architect is influencing and being involved in the whole realisation project process, which is the lesson from contemporary Swiss architecture. Uh, why is it so excellent? That's one of the reasons. Nowadays, because of procurement methods and contracts, that's very difficult in big projects. Building across the road is a very good example of how somehow, amazingly, uh, a number of architects have managed to keep, keep that influence all the way through working incredibly closely with a, a very good main contractor so that the handrails and everything like that have that touch. But one of the reasons why that's the case is because the contractor themselves have been involved in developing that design, which a story which will probably come out at some point in a lot more interesting detail. And that same contractor has architects on their staff, Joel and Ardy particularly, who I'm sure some of you met, somebody graduate from this school. The interesting thing about being involved with a contractor, which traditionally architects have seen as the enemy, but in actual fact are our hands as architects, is that as technologies become more sophisticated, and bigger companies start to take on the risks and therefore are the final decision makers, in other words, the contractors and developers, it allows the architects the opportunity to be involved in them and influence within rather than out with. And I think that's another absolutely vital, in fact, it's a crucial area of influence for architects. Otherwise, the crap that somebody so eloquently and rightly points out is, is going to continue because I think that's the reason why it is mediocre is because architects aren't, partly, aren't, architects aren't influencing that whole stage, their front-end work, or if they're involved in it at all. So I think the involvement as, as members of a contracting team uh, within the company is a crucial area for architects' influence in the future. I, th I think this is a key point, because um, if, if we think of what the attributes of a traditional architect what might they be? I mean, are, are we going to see the likes of Brunelleschi again? Are we going to see 
the likes of Vanbrugh or Sohn. I mean, just let's actually look at the oeuvre that these architects were responsible for. And key to this actually is that concept of craft. There's an elegance and an ingenuity in the making. And I think Chris's comments are very interesting because what they do is they posit, in fact, a new way that architects should be working. I mean, it should be axiomatic that our primary relationship in the design team is with contractors. They are indeed our hands. And I mean, the interesting thing is if you look at a country like Japan, which has over 200 schools of architecture, you know, actually not a huge population. Why does it do that? Because the vast majority of graduates actually go and work with contracting teams. So actually, there is a possibility for us to reconfigure our relationships within the professional design team in a way to restore the potency of the architectural vision. I don't think we're ever going to be the conductor of the orchestra again and in some ways actually I think that's a sort of fairly repugnant and old-fashioned vision but I think using the creative skills we have to get greater leverage is actually a question of us forming creative partnerships and there is a problem which is that we are educated as individuals and we then have this massive cultural shock that we have to work in teams. And this is true whether it's even at the most modest level of project development. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural schism between the nature of the education and the realisation of the architectural project. And I think that's something we have to address. Um, just responding to that, um, there's a statistic which gets bandied around, I don't know how accurate it is, but within this country something like 95% of buildings designed in the UK are designed by non-architects. Um, and while, while we as architects can you know, fight to take a bigger stake in that, something bigger obviously needs to change to, to make that different. I'd be interested to know what this, this statistic was in Japan where they have so many architecture schools and they must be doing something fundamentally different in the way the system is set up and whether that's through the protection of function as well as title, I don't know. Um, but I was wondering if you had any... I, I, I think there's something about the cultural embedding of design and architecture in some countries which simply gets it right. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I, I mean, I worked in Holland for a while at the Arnhem School running an architecture and management master's course, as it happens. And... Uh, of course, it's a protected activity in the Netherlands, which isn't, it isn't here. We have a protected title here, and it's fundamentally different. So in other words, any project in the Netherlands actually has to be realised with an architect involved in it. And it creates very inventive ways of, in which things are delivered. And we, heard, we had one uh, such case study. I think it's really fascinating. I, I think it's a question of us forming different relationships. I think it's actually about 92% of projects are realised without architects. It's about, it's significantly worse in the United States. You know, I think Rainer Bannum used to say, uh, in the UK you have to go hundreds of miles to see good buildings, in, the, in America you have to go thousands of miles. And I, I always thought that was a, an interesting way of looking at it. But it's about forming different relationships, unquestionably. I wouldn't mind just asking one myself. Um, I, I, I was struck by the point that, that, in fact, it always made me seem, um, it seemed weird in school that we were all being trained to be Corbusier, and then, as you said, we go out into the world and we work with a group of people, even if you maintain that single, as a single practitioner, you still have to work with clients, you still have to work with other professionals, etc. And it was a, a great moment of revelation to me to learn that in collaboration, you can actually make better stuff. Um, because I would al I'd always been sort of, it always, nobody has explicitly said it, but it always been suggested that in fact, no, no, you are the genius. And if you're not a genius, you're a mope and you should, you know, go do something else like accounting or something to that. <laughs> so I just, I just, I wonder what the panel thinks about that notion in terms of, because we do some work to try to get people to learn how to collaborate. I don't think the school is particularly bad at, at getting collaborations, but I think different schools do, do different things about how you teach people to learn to collaborate because the biggest thing in collaboration is trust. And uh, it's, it, it can be a difficult thing to, to teach you can, trust. Can I tell an anecdote? Um, about 10 years ago, I was doing an entrepreneurship program in Bradford. And I got in early and I was walking through Lister Park, which is the park endowed by 
in dint of philanthropic Victorian activity. And I was walking through it, and there's this group of people kind of standing in an area. And I kind of looked at them, and they looked different from everybody else. They certainly looked different from everybody in Bradford, and they were wearing particular clothes. And I get closer up, and there was a lot of talk about form and flow and various things. And I thought, that looks like a bunch of architects. <laughs> and uh, in fact, and I just said jokingly, it could even be CABE, the Commission on Architecture and the Built Environment. And I went into my meeting uh, with the head of housing or whatever it was, and I said, there was a bunch of people in list up. He went, oh, that was CABE. They were down here to tell us how to do things properly. And that is, in a way, the kind of symbol of what and how people viewed architects, this lofty body that had arrived to make people's lives better in isolation. And I think one of the things that's really interesting that's come through consistently from the whole panel is that has to go. That cannot, cannot continue. It's not economic. It will not give you a living. It's actually about partnership and it's also about creativity. And it's also meeting other people who disagree, which give you the creative spark. And that's the exciting bit. That's the entrepreneurial bit. So, you know, if you, if you want to go and visit Lister Park and pass views. Oh, and a challenge for you. There's a magazine called the Scottish Review online and uh, really interesting. There's an article in it yesterday called Glasgow's Disgrace, and it refers to the unfinished building in Edinburgh, but it says Glasgow's Disgrace is the beginning of Suckey Hall Street. As you move from St George's, St Charing Cross bit, down the unpedestrianised bit. And in it, Andrew Hook, former professor of English, says, this area has been a mess since 2001 when the master plan was produced and it was going to regenerate everything and it's failed. And he said, uh, but there's now something that's been formed called a business improvement district. And he was quite upset about this because it was led by business and commerce. And he said, it's all going to be about the garage and lots and lots of buildings. And he said, far better to give the money to some of the young students at the School of Art up the road to make things better. Now, I will leave you with that on how you want to respond, because I think a response is actually required. You can respond, but it's not on your own terms. It's actually going to speak to the Business Improvement District people and say, we're up the road. We're part of this. We use this. How can we get involved in this? How can we help change all of these things? Do something. So there's a little challenge for you. Can I, I think... I think Luca Brizzi was quite a collaborator, actually, when you think of the number of people who did. Anyway, I think, I think just because you're designing projects on yourself or spending time in the studio, it doesn't in any way preclude uh, the need or desire to work in teams. Actually, I think one of the two things that you need to do to be able to work uh, with other people, one is you need to enjoy playing. And I think I suspect if you, if, you weren't, if you didn't enjoy playing with people before you became a student, you're unlikely to be enjoying working in teams after you graduate. And secondly, you, want, you need a desire to do it and the recognition that you can't do, architects can't build buildings without other people. We can't do it ourselves, unless, unless you're James, <laughs> who can do it in the Global South. And even he needs people to build as well. So I think, I think there needs to be a desire, and I think there needs to be uh, a, almost a temperamental uh, interest in doing it. Can I just add to that? I think I would totally agree, because I think group work in uni is like a bad word, you know? It's like the thing you do at the start of a project when everyone's doing site analysis and nobody wants to do it and they all hate each other. And then as soon as you can, you split away and you do your own project. And actually, the hardest thing I think we did in uni and the most successful and the best thing we ever did in uni was stay working as a group. So we did our masters and just kept working together, even though it was quite difficult and we shouted each other at some points. We just kept doing it and it gave us far more successful results because everyone's got good ideas and then together you've got a lot more good ideas. So I'm still working with the person that I started group work in fifth year with and, and for me that is shows how valuable that is actually. Can, can I just ask something? Um, Chris you were talking about the or group work and how that's or, or just generally practice is such a collective activity and education is, is a singular thing. Uh, how does that actually though translate into 
architectural education because uh, I think you're saying obviously group, group work is seen as the dull part and I used to think that when I was at university but that's often because uh, universities use group projects to get rid of the dull section of the course um, and I think that uh, certainly that was the case in my school I'm getting some mixed looks there but um, but I, I think I think that there's a degree and, uh, but I think I think there's a degree to which um, the whole of the of the course should be a collaborative thing. I think li the live project concept, um, schools working or having projects that are real and students engaging with those and actually facilitating, bringing people together. The architect is the often the central person in any project, uh, but they often work totally alone and I think that they need to to act more as a facilitator bringing different people together I think that starts at university not something you learn when you get into practice the the Peter Buchanan article which was published in the AR last September he proposed this idea of a foundation course shared across disciplines really to get away from what he called the solitary genius of the architect and I think um, what I found very inspiring in visiting your school today is seeing your work alongside other disciplines my architecture school we were in a Georgian terrace uh, building with each studio in a different room so it was hard to see what other people were working on um, but our diploma units we were working on joint uh, uh, sites and had to work find a way of doing a master plan together um, so there are I'm sure lots of examples of way of, of design work being done together but when I went to business school, they, uh, um, I did a one-year full-time MBA program where we were deliberately put into groups of five people from different backgrounds to make it deliberately difficult. And we did a lot of group projects, and it was an incredible learning experience of how to work more effectively and efficiently with people that you don't get on with. Um, and so I think there are, there are very good ways of incorporating group work um, into uh, education. You don't need an, uh, an educational organization to work together in a group. You can do that yourself. You can set that up yourself. Um, we had some great initiatives when I was at uni, um, which was they were all out with the university uh, curriculum. And they were one of the strongest gestures and, and learning moments that I had during my education. So there's nothing that stops you from doing that. I actually um, graduated with somebody else, which was very unheard of. Um, but it won his awards uh, and it was a very joyful process. And I think we, we, Stuart and I spoke about this before. Working together um, really makes you a better designer because you can reflect your ideas. You can bounce off your ideas and they actually will become stronger because of it. So I would actually recommend doing it yourself. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk about the sort of solitary nature about of architects, um, whether that's within ed, within within education or sort of outside it. Um, and I was kind of wondering whether um, that could and that could be addressed in institutions and how at other universities um, there seems to be a kind of a disconnect between creative education and maybe academic education and how if there if there wasn't that disconnect then potentially wider society would have a greater idea of what architects and creative people do and then that might mean that you know less crap gets built because people know kind of what crap isn't and stuff like that um, I'm just wondering whether you <laughs> any of you think that uh, a kind of connection between art schools and universities like a, a a further, yeah, further connection between art schools and universities is, is desirable or not? Just a an interesting point. Um, planners used to go to Glasgow School of Art, and the planning course and the kind of outlook that they had was reflected in the title of where they studied. As planning moved away from that and became more focused in different things and different approaches, I think planning has suffered substantially. If you speak to planners of a particular era, they talk about it being the stories and people and place. It now moves much more into development control and legal things and structure and plan 
an organisation. And this creative tension that you're talking about, you could actually see when Dundee University took over the Scottish Crop Research Institute and Duncan of Jordanston and brought them into the university and the then Vice Chancellor Arnold Langland said the most exciting thing for him was putting the artists with the chemists looking at the pathogens in potatoes and he said the artists were going whoa look at those sheep now you could do this and you could turn this into all of this and the chemists and the researchers who were looking at cancer cells in potatoes were going We've never thought about it like that before. This is amazing. And the artists were going, these are beautiful. They were going, they're deeply destructive. But this whole thing was going backwards and forwards. And he said, I think it was a real disappointment. The one thing he really wanted to see happen was um, when they built the Welcome Building, they had this giant naked mesh woman um, thing of me Mac a piece of architecture, and they never and it, she was kind of draped over the welcome centre. And they never quite managed to get the funding for that. But that would have been, as he said, an amazing indication of how he was bringing together science and art. And that's what, what is all, and that's entrepreneurial as well. It's this creativity, it's the tension. That's same. But there are examples, and I think we've moved away from that. But you're better pleased to. No, I, th I, think, I think you're right. I think the, one of the untapped potentials still here, for us here, is greater connection to the other disciplines in the art school. And although we do that to a certain extent with shared classes or electives, we don't do it as much as we could, but it does rely on the other disciplines to be able to buy into that. And that's quite challenging sometimes, not from a point of view of they don't want to deal with us as architects, but actually just from an institutional timetabling, all that. But that is an, unta I mean, that's to a certain extent why perhaps all of you are here to study architecture, to be within an art school and have some sort of experience. So for me, it'd be great if you could choose in first year to have an elective in textile or jewellery and in fifth year do the same. And that somehow you could not do some sort of quasi ecumenical art cross fertilization project, but actually go in and, and find out how a jeweller draws, look at it from a different perspective. And, I, and I'm hoping, and the ethos of the shared workshops across the road is indeed exactly that, that you somehow just bump into that person who's cutting. But to, to be honest, in terms of the public, I've always, uh, I've always thought that architecture needs a sitcom. Every other profession has a drama, a sitcom, you know, you name it, from teachers to detectives. You've got Ted Mosby. Sorry? <laughs> You've got Ted Mosby. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. Mr. Brady of the Brady Bunch was in the Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, any more comments? We've got it. We'll get it to the sort of wrapping up place, but I don't want to preclude. I know Ambrose wanted to. Is I have you? No? <laughs> Robert? Uh, if I may, just on that last point about collaboration across the other courses, within the Glasgow School of Art, uh, architecture is the longest course and as you go into first year in halls with the other students by the time you go into diploma if you carry on here for the both courses you are not with the same people you started with and I was wondering whether a the shorter kind of four-year honours course would bring that more in line so that the last two years of architectural education isn't just architects in the studio not connected with the people you started with that's to Chris. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think sharing a flat is a good enough reason to sh shorten the course. <laughs> but it is a reason. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think there are other reasons why the, the, the length of the course and the current model is, is being re-looked at. And I think that's quite, quite legitimate. I mean, I think, as I say, there's some, and I haven't quite thought it through myself, but certainly four academic years with one year somehow sandwiched in with practice is some is where I feel the course could be and I don't know what that means in terms of degrees and whatever it is I would get rid of the degree frankly if it was me but I do think that somehow uh, there could be some sort of an arrangement where uh, we shorten the length and we allow a more porous arrangement which allows students to earn in architecture as well as learn and I think uh, I'm not quite sure how we go about that or wh where, whether that would be something you could choose to do in first year. I'm going to do my year out in first year or second year. That might also be possible. But, but certainly, as I talk to particularly the other heads of schools in Scotland, 
Uh, that's the debate that we're having at the moment. And, and we've got different opinions about it, but I don't see the, the part one, two, three, and the f five plus two as being the future in any way. Um, one of the things I wondered about um, was within the five or the six or the however many years you're, you're here, um, was integrating a much stronger practical side. Um, what we found really beneficial was actually building stuff. So, you know, getting your hands dirty, the, probably one of our most successful projects we almost built ourselves in collaboration with a stonemason and a joiner. And uh, what, the one thing that shocked me when I left uni was the first time I sat down on site as chairing a meeting with a stonemason who had been doing his work for 30 years and I had to tell him to redo something. And I did not have that experience. But if I... I would know how to draw better had I had more practical experience. It could be something which is, you, you could get paid for as well, you know. <laughs> um, one thing that talk studio do, the young guys, they're building stuff. They just go for it. And I think that's a really important well, aspect. Absolutely. We've accelerated that whole live, live build activity in the school this year across three years. We did a big study internationally to look at that last year. Uh, James is here specifically to lead a self-build project in Ghana. He's already built five buildings in different parts of the world with groups of students built, built them. So I think I've noticed in this school and in other schools, there seems to be a, a growing interest in the making, the physical making. Now it might be, I don't know, that, this is for you, be interesting to hear your views, but it might be because it's a, as it were, an antidote to the last 12 years of digital work that you've been involved in. I don't know. But I also think my own deeper sense is that it's actually a search for young graduates or young students to find what is the fundamentals of being an architect and architecture. And if you strip away all the mechanisms and the, and the disciplines and the collaborations and you're left with just material and a, a project to build, somehow maybe I'll find that in that. And I think that is a very interesting moment in, in a young person, a young architect's development. And in another dimension, last year I was working in a college and they were to be, you know, entrepreneurial activity and one of the lecturers said for the 20 plus years I've been here I've been showing students how to paint the same wall and we build bricks we get the bricks and we build walls and we do the same thing and then we knock it all down at the end of the term and we start it all again and he said it would be so much more interesting if we could actually build something and that discussion sparked a huge interest in the rest of the staff, not least, oddly enough, from the health and safety people who got terribly excited and they said, oh, that would be wonderful if we built something and showed people the health and safety aspects as it went along. It's not, and they got really excited and passionate about health and safety. There are opportunities that are out there. And actually, this comes back to working with the contractors and the builders of the future. So there are collaborations that can be made with colleges that are building, th that are teaching people how to build things. That's where the exciting area comes from. And it's ready and they're wanting to, you know, open up and talk and listen. I'd, I'd like to draw close to today's debate um, and invite, invite uh, the organisers up to give a concluding statement. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, this debate is going to continue to, to go on. I think it's important that we as students have a, a voice and we can present that voice. So I'd like to start the vote of, vote of thanks by thanking a, um, AD Scotland for videoing the event and it will be published online so we can continue to comment on this. I mean, we've discussed what, what architecture is, what education is, and indeed what an architect is, and how do we approach it and how do we adapt to change. How does architectural education ensure that it remains both fit for purpose and for the profession and all its difficult realities, socially, intellectually, culturally relevant, with a coherent ethos, ultimately transcending fashion and opinion into order to con contribute meaningfully to the enduring fabric and structure of our lives? We are all individual and the outcome of our education will all be different. We have a selection of individuals here, all with backgrounds in architecture, or with Ian uh, in interest now in architecture. Um, so I'd like to thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, Lucy Hanneke, Stuart, Ian, David, and Chris. And thank you, Robert, for, for hosting.